Welcome back, Kings fans, to another Bailey's Movie Night. We are talking about Little Big League, which we hope you just watched. I am Jesse Cohen. Joining me tonight, Michael Alexander. How are you doing tonight, Michael? I am doing wonderful, Jesse. Thank you so much for having me here, my friend. Still our pleasure. And, of course, producer Bailey. How are you doing tonight, Bailey? <laughs> All right. Bailey's excited. And so are we, because joining us tonight is Timothy Busfield, star of Screen and Film. How are you doing tonight, Timothy? I'm really good. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on, you guys. Our pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Now, Michael, I know you have a ton of questions for the man and a ton of questions about the movie, and I know Kings fans do as well. So, Kings fans, fill up that chat with your questions, and let's start it off. Michael, what do you got? All right. Well, first off, Tim, thank you so much for being here. I know you're over on the East Coast. I know it's late over there, so we truly appreciate uh, you being here. Um, obviously, we could talk months and months about all the amazing projects you've done as a director, writer, actor. Um, but we'll focus on the movie for starting because I just got finished watching uh, Little Big Lead, which uh, Time.com ranked the most underrated baseball movie of all time. Little wow. did you know. Um, so we were talking a little bit before Jesse and I, before you hopped on, Tim. I think the first thing people would love to know is, do you actually play baseball? Did you have any baseball experience before you got cast in this film? And what's your baseball background? Well, I did. I played a lot of baseball. I played baseball really up until last year. I played hardball in uh, in uh, a few leagues here in New York. Um, yeah, I played. I grew up. I was a counselor at Mickey Owen Baseball School. I started playing Little League like everybody else and, and then uh, high school and then played on a bit of a traveling team. And uh, with the, some of the older guys when I was, you know, junior high age, I was able to play. I always played a, a, a grade or two. Uh, and then played through my 20, played semi-pro ball, uh, started playing semi-pro ball at 16, uh, in Arkansas. Uh, I'd play Legion ball and then I'd play semi-pro ball, uh, at night, uh, with, uh, other teams or during the day, played a lot of ball, uh, and, um, just continued playing baseball and softball. Uh, and then I nine years playing when we did the movie i was playing with the sacramento smokies and the sacramento smokies was a uh a semi-pro and for those people out there that wonder what semi-pro is it's really just college league baseball and then pro players in the league we played in the team i played on um and i i so i did i played a lot of baseball and you had to play baseball to be in that movie it's it's got probably the best I didn't know that about Time Magazine, but I think it was really important to Andy Scheinman, uh, the director, and Ad Adam Scheinman, his brother, who, who wrote it uh, with him. And I think it was important that the, the quality of baseball be really good. So I was the worst guy, I think, on our team. Uh, and and, uh, and I, was, I was a pretty good ball player. So, you know, we had, you know, Bull Durham and Kevin Elster and all everybody on it were minor leaguers or college ball players that are really high level. So it was the baseball was good. Bailey, we know you love baseball and we know you're impressed with his swing, but you're going to have to go ahead and unblur your background so we can read those signs you're holding up. Uh, but Timothy, I'm curious, um, given your love for baseball and given your experience with it, was it meaningful to you to to appear in so many great baseball projects over the years? Well, it was just kind of, I mean, it was luck uh, with Field of Dreams. It was, it was, you know, I wasn't a ball player uh, in the movie uh, uh, and I wasn't, uh, I, I, did, I didn't have to play ball in it and it, none of my baseball past really mattered in that movie. So the fact that I had, uh, you know, played a lot of baseball uh, and it was sort of my passion uh, outside my hobby, outside of acting. Uh, that was great. And Little Big League, um, you know, was really just, you know, I, I was playing ball with the Sacramento Smokies and People Magazine had picked it up. And, uh, you know, there was a, a pro team in the Northern League uh, that that uh, my the guy who had my, con my contract was with called me and said he could get me 500 a month to play with Saskatchewan of the Northern League which is, you know, the, the guys that run around the bases backwards and spin their heads on bats. It's that league, St. Paul Saints and, and those guys. And uh, I think I had sneakers or something, so I couldn't do it. Um, but, you know, at, at that time, 
you know, I was in my 30s playing really good baseball in the state of California, and I think that helped Andy Scheinman, uh, uh, you know, know that I could I could pull off Luke Collins. Uh, Jesse, to, to to hop in on your question there, when uh, you were doing the film, was your character Lou based off of an actual? Uh, twins player or a baseball player? I read a couple different articles with different answers, and I know, if did you emulate your swing of any player specific? I know Kent Herbeck was one of the players that I read. Is that true, or was your character loosely based on yeah. any real actual baseball player? Well, here's how it worked. Uh, uh, and all uh, I have answers for all, all of that. Um, first of all, I, I was, uh, I'm a right-handed hitter. I'm not a left-handed hitter. And of all the positions that I uh, First base wasn't one of them. Uh, oh. I very seldom, those were, you know, usually I pitched or I played, you know, middle, middle infield, uh, third base. I caught a bit, but I was a pitcher mostly, uh, uh, probably 27 on. I was primarily 20, you know, that's what I did the most. And, um, you know, I was a, a lead, one of the leads in the movie and, you know, Castle Rock, Columbia movie. And they sent me to, Minnesota, and I had a locker between uh, Dave Winfield and Kirby Puckett uh, for all the home games in in the month of September. Uh, and I was taking a batting practice from Steve Winfield, Dave Winfield's brother, had a batting cage, and we were trying to figure out the left-handed swing. And I had a good left-handed swing from wiffle ball. Uh, because we played home run derby and I could get that, I could get the arc on the ball. I could undercut. Whereas from the right side, I was always a little guy. And even though I might've been a three hitter or a two hitter, three hitter, four hitter, uh, in high school and, and beyond, uh, I, I wasn't a home run hitter. You know, I was a single double guy. I could bunt, I could hit the ball the other way. And that was not Luke Collins. Luke Collins needed to, you know, he needed to go deep. And so uh, we kind of worked on Will Clark at the time. I, oh. I tried my best to knock off Will's swing, I think, and a little bit of his head, what was going on in his head at the plate. And I was trying to, I sort of channeled Will, Will Clark a little bit uh, at the time, and th that helped me there. Um, as far as the, uh, the, when they shot, they had to shoot a lot of the wide shots you see of the twins playing ball, the real wide shots uh, were, were the real twins in the real state against real teams. And then we, we would shoot the, the, the close-ups and stuff in those games. But they had a camera uh, crew shooting that last month of September a lot. And, and uh, I most matched with Chip Hale. And Chip Hale was, a, was number four, so I was number Number four, uh, he was bigger and stronger than me. Obviously, uh, I mean, I was like wearing three sets of sliding pants, and I was wearing three pairs of socks just so I could look like I had muscles. Um, and having to stand next to Junior, or Wally Joyner, or any of those guys, you know, I was five ten. These guys are six three. Um, I was standing on the base. I was doing anything I could to look like a ball player, look like I could hit a double, uh, you know. And um, so I, well, uh, my swing was not like Chip Hales, but Chip taught me a lot. And and, and uh, they wouldn't let me bat right-handed. You know, I was in a rotation with the Twins, and uh, I was in rotation in infield, and Herbeck was teaching me how to play first just through infield practice. And uh, uh, that was a great one. There was a earlier that summer, I'd thrown batting practice to uh, uh, D. Sarcina, the Angels, D. Sarcina, and and maybe Edmonds. I'm not, I threw a few guys, I threw batting practice for the California Angels. And Rod Carew offered me, they said it was the best batting practice they'd ever had. And they, uh, Rod Carew offered me 25 bucks a day to be the batting practice pitcher for the California angels. And I was down there doing a broadcast. I was, uh, I was already, you know, do, doing TV and movies and stuff. And I said, I, you know, couldn't do it. And then the twins were playing the angels. And I was in taking infield before the game and the fans were coming in 
And the angels were just ragging on me because when I threw batting practice, I was in an angel's uniform. And then three months later, I'm in a twins uniform. And they were really teasing me. And I had a great time with that. Um, I got to know Tony Oliva, uh, great Hall of Famer. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, Tom Kelly let me. I wanted so badly the show that I could hit. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I just couldn't hit Major League pitching left-handed. It's really movie magic and you know i was just i knew that if i could make the swing look good uh then we could pull it off and andy scheinman knew that as well i'm very lucky he did that we've got a quick me. quick question from the uh chat room tim uh gil garcia wants to know which big leaguer in the film was your favorite to work with oh that's a good one well i mean junior ken griffey jr was we had a ball i mean he was kid like and we just spent the day and he was really really fun but you know so many uh there were so many great players and I, we were a bit in awe of these guys they would roll out and do phenomenal things uh you know we had mickey tettleton and uh we had pudge and sandy alomar and you know carlos by we had just a, randy johnson of course and wally joiner great I will tell a story, Griffey. There's a, a moment in the movie where Griffey hits a home run. The and three run shot. The, you know, the, the, when we're doing, when we're doing, uh, uh, you know, we're going fast. You got 12 hours. You know, we're no, you don't just lollygag your way through the filming of something. It's like this. And the ball players would get sucked into that energy, you know, and see, and, it's a little intimidating and you got people yelling, all right, quiet, here we go. And, you know, yelling, you know, the ADs and Griffey came up and they threw him a couple warm up pitches and he had a couple balls past me. They were like scud missiles. I've never seen anything. And I had been throwing batting practice, those major leaguers, I threw batting practice to Puckett and Winfield. And, you know, I, when I was working out with those guys and all those major leaguers, the one thing you notice with anybody who played triple A ball and above is that they can put backspin on a hundred mile an hour fastball. Wow. And their balls go about two fifty feet and then they climb a lot. Uh, they, they, they don't, you can't, which you can really see from the mound uh, better than anywhere from behind the plate from the other, from the infield positions, you don't see it as well. Uh, certainly the outfielders know to gauge it, that it's going to stay up in the air. But especially when you have a wood bat grabbing a leather ball, if it catches a seam and, and they're hitting for backspin, they'll go like this and then they'll, they'll kind of just go up to another level. And Griffey's balls were just rockets. Uh, they were not necessarily backspin. And they were just shots. Uh, scary to be around. He hit a couple of them. And then Andy, and then I went down and listened to what Andy Scheinman was saying to him. And the director said, "You know, Junior, we'd love for you to hit a ball over the bat in section three twenty-five." And he goes, "Okay." And so I run down to first, and they call action. And they throw the pitch, and boom, he hits the ball up into section three twenty-five. Rounds the bases. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, then there's cut, and now there's hubbub with the director talking. And I was like, what could they possibly want to go again for? That was movie magic. Did they not get it? And so I ran down to hear what they were saying. And the director said, Junior, that was phenomenal. It was great. But you actually hit it in section 323. <laughs> and so it left the frame. It wasn't it wasn't actually in the the ball didn't go where we want it lined up. And while they were talking to him, he picked up the bat. He was looking at the bat and he fiddled it like you would if it was crack. And he banged it on the ground. And I looked and it had a little crack in it. A little crack in a hairline crack in the bat. And he bent it a little bit and they and they started yelling, We gotta go, we gotta go. And so I ran back down to first and they called action and he took the next pitch and he hit it into section 325 exactly where they wanted over the baggie into the upper deck with a broken bat. Uh, and you just, 
I, that that kind of control over the baseball, I'd never seen anything like it. So Junior was really fun. Randy Johnson, apparently, I didn't hear him say it. He was kind enough to not let me hear him say it. But <laughs> when I came out to the plate to bat off him, which I couldn't hit him at all, I couldn't, I don't think I touched maybe one ball wow. that I could touch uh, off Randy Johnson. He and I even said, can you throw four seams, which is the straightest of all, but four seams, same speed, 70s, twice out over the middle of the plate. And he said, I don't know how to do it. He didn't know how to do it. And he said, my arm shot from the end. This was October, right? Oh, so uh, I, I, I go back and the director, the, 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 the director, Andy Scheidman, he calls him out. And he says, I don't understand. He said, um, Mattingly and Boggs are taking themselves out of the game when I go to New York to play the Yankees. And Busfield is going to hit a ball over the fence? How does that work? Uh, and they told me about it. He meant it. Uh, he, was, he was a good guy. Um, you know, I had a great, I just, so many, there was Tim Raines. We, we shot. Uh, our Yankee Stadium stuff was done uh, in Chicago, where the White Sox, their stadium, uh, in their older stadium, and it was bitter cold. It was really, really the coldest, one of the cold I've ever experienced. Listen, we were all underneath doing our warm ups and taking batting practice, and Tim Raines came out dead cold, stretched a little bit, swung the bat, swung it a couple times, and then walked up to the plate and hit a home run. Um, <laughs> That's when you realize that that level of ball was unattainable to me at any level. And, and you realize that um, so these professional athletes, these Kings players, these guys, they're just better than everybody else. There's no luck in sports. So if you, you can't play, you don't stay. Um, and you realize with these, we had a lot of Hall of Famers in that movie. Uh, Paul O'Neill, uh, just a, a great group of people. And But the guys on my team were great. Elster, uh, who had a record with the Mets for the most games without an error at some point. And he, was a, he had three home runs in one day he, when they opened up uh, San Francisco's new ballpark that they have. He was the first guy buried and it went out that day. Kevin Elster hit three. Uh, we had uh, Brad Leslie, who rest. Rest in peace isn't with us anymore. We had Bull uh, with us, and, and everybody else on our team could play ball. I was like, like I said, I was the worst player on our team. <laughs> but but the best actor, right? Yes, the, I was going to say, and the most lovable character, of course. <laughs> uh, you know, I was not the best actor. Jason Robards was in the movie. Uh, you had Dennis Farina in it, but I'm going to give best actor to Jason Robards in that movie for sure. <laughs> Yeah, Jason was great. And uh, Bailey wanted to make sure I told you this there, Tim. If we talked about, uh, you had early mentioned your number four. I don't know if you even know this, but uh, you've been in a million movies, but there's one movie that you kind of had a special cameo in. So in Major League Three, uh, Back to the Miners, uh, Roger Dorn is a character. He ends up buying a baseball team, and they have an exhibition game against the Twins. And in the screen, in the, in the shot, they actually have Roger Dorn's suite and your actual Lou Collins' jersey is in a frame paying a tribute to you, and it's in Major League Three. And uh, Bailey put a screenshot on the Twitch to look at. But yeah, so I don't know if you knew that, but that's a little throwback to your film in Major League Three, your character. I just heard that this year for the first time. I didn't know that, and I don't know if I had noticed when I got there. Um, it was great. It was really cool. You know, uh, Louisville Slugger made me bats. You know, with Luke Collins, and I got I got You know, I said I need like a wiffle ball bat. I need. Do they make anything that's 20 ounces at 30 at 33 inches long? You know, because I had to have bat speed and everybody else could play. And, and they sent me bats and I'd never played with, I mean, I've experienced pro in my life, but the wood those guys have uh, really helped a lot of the ball that jumped off my bat in the movie. A lot of that was just simply because the wood I had was so good. And uh, one more before you take over, Jesse, because it's kind of relating to this, and I had it written down, and a fan asked as well. Obviously, the movie is really, really a cult following. It's just really well done. I think one of the reasons you mentioned, of course, the actual look of the baseball players, the actors look like they really played baseball like yourself, and the 
baseball players themselves. But I thought the three kids were actually fantastic in that film. Did you have any kind of off-screen bonding with them? I know you teach acting as well. Did you give them any uh, pointers or tips, especially uh, Luke, who played Billy, you know, your uh, soon-to-be stepson from the film? Um, did you hang out with them off the screen, or did you shoot a lot with them just, you know, when you weren't actually filming on camera to kind of teach them a little bit of acting? Because those three, I thought, did a fantastic job. Because sometimes you see a kid's movie, and the kids aren't that great. These three were fantastic, I thought. Yeah, yeah, they were great. Uh, I think you're talking about Billy and Miles. The, I mean, the guys that played uh, uh, Chuck and, and Arthur, those guys, and um, Joey. Uh, you know, when you work with kids in movies, um, you're very seldom around them when they're working. I only had those scenes with Luke, but he was in school. You know, those guys, they go to school, and then they come out. And they do their scenes and they go back to school. So, and I didn't need to give, I didn't have, I didn't have any for any of the guys. Luke was already a natural and he was really great. And Andy was all over that performance. And I didn't have any, you know, I was struggling to keep up with baseball. I was no position to be given advice to anybody on that movie. I was, you know, I was in over my head with, you know, with Ken Griffey Jr. and trying to blend in as a baseball player with those movies and stand on top of the ball. Um, no, uh, uh, they were great in it. They were funny and charming. And, you know, a lot of that was the script. It was, it was the original script. And then it was, uh, the script that was coming out each day on the set with Adam and Andy, you know, the brothers who, who made the movie and Andy Scheinman, um, you know, this is a guy that produced Castle as a partner at Castle Rock and, you know, was a part of Princess Bride and, and so many great films there. So the pet, his pedigree uh, was enough, and and the people in his life to work with, um, and those kids, and they were boy like themselves, Andy and and Adam. They were a couple of kids, so um, you know, I they were great. I didn't really have anything to say, and I was in awe of those guys when I saw it. They really bring such heart. That storyline is is really great with the boys. I mean, it's simple. You know, it's impossible to let stardom not have an effect on you. Uh, and and watching the movie, that happen in the movie, and those buddies pull back from him, you know, they pulled it off. And I thought they pulled it off really well. I think we lost you, Jesse, on the audio. Well, there we go. Oh, sorry about that. I think no I'm problem, back now. Jesse. Uh, Michael alluded to it earlier, Tim, you have an, an impressive resume. I think you have over 650 IMDb credits. To me personally, uh, you'll always be the, uh, the mean brother-in-law from Field of Dreams, um, a role that, I mean, you played so perfectly because everybody just loves to hate that guy, no offense. But I'm curious, uh, of all the roles you've played, what one do you get recognized the most out on the street? Do people come up to you and say, hey, I loved you in, what's the movie or TV show that you get the most? Well, 30-something was a TV show, Michael's mom's show. Uh, 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 <laughs> oh, she's going to love you for that. <laughs> um, that show was, you know, that was, you know, we were, those were championship seasons. You know, those were, we were nominated every year for best show. I was nominated, you know, every year for supporting actor and finally picked up a, an Emmy in the last year. So that's the one that, you know, those were our gold records, you know, and the West Wing, a lot of people would recognize me from the 28 episodes of the West Wing that I did and Field of Dreams. Uh, all those, I look very similar to what I look like <laughs> now. So, um, you know, First Kid or, or Revenge of the Nerds, you know, some of those other movies where I was more character driven and had a different look that I was working on or some of the TV movies or, you know, I, I didn't look as much like I do. I mean, if I got recognized as Poindexter, I'd put a bullet in my head. I, I wouldn't <laughs> want to look like that guy. I don't want any, you don't want anybody walking down the street and say, Hey man, are you Poindexter? Uh, that would be a problem. Um, I did. I was at the, when the Red Sox, uh, uh, beat the Yankees and won four in a row to come wow. back and beat them back in early 2000s. I was at a game with my best friend and we were watching after the game. We just stayed standing after the game and we we're both Detroit Tiger fans. 
But uh, a, a Red Sox fan was taunting <laughs> the Yankee fans, and the Yankees had, they were up three nothing, and then lost four in a row, four in a row. Uh, and ended up not making it to the World Series. And uh, this guy was just banging on these Yankees. The Yankees were getting hot. And these guys, I thought, were going to kill him. And I took my program and I jammed it in the Red Sox chest. And I said, you got to get out of here. And he looked at me and said, Poindexter. And he, <laughs> he looked like that. And the Yankee guys, the Yankee guys, went, Poindexter. And I was like, ah. And I ended up signing up for and, and I broke up what could have been a casualty. So that was the one time that it was really <laughs> good to be recognized. Um, Field of Dreams was, uh, well, was, uh, uh, you know, I mean, a great experience. That was, again, again, like, like Little Big League was Andy and Adam, uh, the Shimans. Uh, you know, Field of Dreams was, was Phil Robinson, who wrote it and directed it. And at the heart of every great movie is a great script. Or, and, and, and the script for Little Big League worked. Um, and I think one of the reasons it did not perform well is we opened across from the Lion King. And that know. first weekend, and I think it was the same year Key of the Year came out. So there would already been a baseball movie. And then uh, 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 the Lion King, we opened the same weekend as the Lion King, which I think <laughs> went on to become like the highest growth of the decade almost, but, uh, but it was a good movie and you knew it would hang on. Uh, and, and they did a good, good job editing it. You know, some of the, the baseball in little big league is without a doubt, the best baseball in any movie. Uh, uh but that's because we have, you know, a, a, a dozen all of the, you know, it's seen, I don't know if we had that many, but we have, uh, in, in that movie, there might be more or probably less, but, the baseball in it's just spectacular. And I think that that holds up. And those kids' performances really, really make the movie. Luke is great. Uh, all the kids were great. Uh, and it was Andy. But it was Andy Scheinman. It was his movie. Bailey, you've got a question? All right, let's see it. <laughs> was it a co oh okay so uh i don't know if you know this I, I mean, obviously you do tim and you're being way too humble you make all of your movies and projects incredible yes directing and writing is very important of course but i agree with jesse every role you're in especially when i was younger i got so mad at you i'm like why don't you believe that there's players on that field don't sell the farm ray and i finally you finally <laughs> went good at the end but what uh, bailey is mentioning is uh obviously you do thousands of theater plays and Broadway and obviously the fans might not know this but a little fun kind of cross-reference is that you obviously did a lot of Broadway and you starred in A Few Good Men and then uh, the baseball player uh, in Little Big League was in the movie A Few Good Men. Did you guys kind of, I, can't, I think the Broadway came before the movie, did you guys have a cross-reference ever talk about that on set? Um, the the uh, Wait, who who, I, who are we talking about in the so, uh, in, in Little Big League? In Little Big League, uh, he played Dawson. He played uh, Wolfgang. The actor Wolfgang played uh, Dawson in the movie. Oh, Wolfgang bought us. Yeah, there you go. Yes, yes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Wolfgang was Wolfgang was. They did that. They did that movie before we did. I did play the Tom Cruise role on Broadway, and uh, Wolfgang was uh, working. Uh, I think behind the scenes and. And they gave him, uh, I think it was Dawson, uh, Dawson who he yep. played uh, in, in, in A Few Good Men. And yeah, we talked about it. And Wolfgang, by the way, I would, we worked out, I worked out with the actors. When the actors showed up, we had our own workouts in the Metrodome. And I would throw batting practice to all the guys in the movie. And I would bucket, I was bam, bam, batting practice. And Wolfgang put one out. Uh, at, at, in the Metrodome, he hit a ball over the fence, hit a shot over the fence. Um, so I remember that he could hit. Yeah, we talked about it. Sure. Yeah. Tim, it, it, your love for sports is evident. I'm curious if you ever considered a career in broadcasting or sports reporting or, or some some form of, of sports. I mean, you, you obviously love it. Um, you know, I, I think I. I would. I've been in a lot of the booth. I've been in a lot of. I, I was in a. I was in a. Uh, they when they had uh, 
I don't know what Monday night baseball or whatever it was when Joe Morgan was in the booth and we were at Dodger stadium and I, I went in the, in the booth, they waved me in to go on in. I sat behind him in the booth and they have the little teleprompter there. And, um, I noticed Eric Davis, uh, had a hitch in his swing and I pointed at it, just sort of leaned forward with the audacity to point at it. And Joe Morgan said, you know, and he nodded and said, you know, you know, that pitch, Eric has always had that hitch. It makes it kind of hard to turn on that inside pitch. And the very next pitch, he just hit just a, just a laser <laughs> out in Dodger Stadium. And I made Joe look bad because Joe just said <laughs> with that, he's been struggling to hit over us. And he turned and glared at me. And I was like, I don't think I'm ever coming back into the booth. <laughs> uh, and then I did, I, I did. I did go into the booth in Toronto. Buck Martinez, uh, great broadcaster, uh, played for the same semi-pro team that I did before I did, obviously. Uh, but he was aware of the fact that I was uh, had played with the Smokies, and he was aware of the fact that I had a pro contract that, that had come to me. And and he we were he invited me in when I was there doing a a movie. Invited me to come to. Um, I was directing an episode of TV invited me to come to uh, sit in the booth with the, uh, with those guys in Toronto. And I, uh, you know, I, 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 it just didn't seem natural for me. I, 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 um, I have, I'm a fan. I love sports. Uh, it just did, it didn't, I, I don't think I, I would be really too awfully good at it. Announcing not the guy in our movie, the twins guy, he was really funny. Uh, uh, those he was really really funny, and I admire him. I mean, I grew up with with uh, some of the uh, you know Gargiola and Kubek and Al Michaels. I was at the earthquake game in San Francisco, and we all poured out into the back. That was a real interesting day because one of the things that had happened, and I found out later, is when we got in the elevator to go up at the, the earthquake game in San Francisco. Cisco back in 88, I think, or I'm not sure when it was, 88, 89, um, we rode up in the elevator. We were in, uh, it was an ABC broadcast and I was on ABC. So sometimes you notice when you're watching a Fox show, they'll cut to Fox actors and we were going up the elevator and Johnny Bench got on the elevator and Willie McCovey was on the elevator. And I was with my best friend, Casey Bennington from high school. And we were like, and Ben was talking to McCovey, and McCovey, that he was asking where somebody was, and he had an unrecognizable name for him. And McCovey said he was, he was, something spooked him. He didn't want to come into the stadium. This is before the earthquake. And we heard it, and we were just didn't know what they were talking about, and it was so quiet and personal. And then later, afterwards, everybody up in the press box area all poured out onto that level after the earthquake. We all went and hung out in there, and there were just all kinds of Hall of Fame baseball players and whatever. And we ended up talking to Johnny Bench, and Bench said that McCovey was with Willie Mays before the game, but Willie didn't want to go in because the air was too still, that he didn't like it, and he had a bad vibe about something. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were talking about before we went into the end of the game was in this one of those guys, Willie Mays, who of course was, you know, made the great catch was one of the great giants of all time was to had an instinct that the, that, that earthquake was going to happen. I thought that was pretty cool. Wow. That's nuts. Bailey, you've got another question. Wow. How long before they would let you leave the stadium that night? That is a good question. Well, you could leave the stadium at, 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 after the earthquake. You could leave the stadium. We all we we hung out for a while. It was interesting. After the earthquake, there was a moment of stillness, and then there was just a roar uh, uh, from really the, the 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 bleachers. It was mostly the A's fans. It was A's Giants, um, and, and they were there, there was a roar like it in like they were, and then you could see smoke coming up from downtown where the bridge had collapsed you could start to see the the smoke and we hung out for a little bit we got out of there i mean the power was off right so as it started to get dark 
it was, we were, by the time we got to the hotel and all the ball players, we were staying at the Cliff Hotel in downtown San Francisco. We got, the bar was open. All the ball players were in there. And we went in and hung out there and then ended up uh, uh, helping people, you know, find their way to the, to this. Everybody was kind of helping out. It was that, you know, a tragedy had happened. People were lost or confused or upset and couldn't find their floor. And, we, you know, we were helping people get to the rooms and stuff. Uh, it was, it was uh, you know, experience we'll, we'll never forget. It was, you know, and it come, those things bring people together. And that, that happened that day. Well, TV I shows. did sign. Somebody, somebody came to me and I did sign a piece of the stadium. Somebody had <laughs> wow. a piece of candlestick. Oh, that's nice. And before the game, before the game, uh, we got there. We got the rental car. We met at the airport, my buddy and I. We got to the rental car. We got to the game. And, and uh, this is when Joe Montana was the quarterback and, and Steve Young was the backup quarterback for the 49ers. And, you know, it's, it's fall, it's October, right? It's world series. And Joe had just been, he had just gone on the disabled list with a, a back injury, like broken a bone in his back. And I got out of our car and I hear somebody go, Tim. And I look over and it's a guy named Fred Tedeschi, who is the, uh, the, the 49ers and had gone to college with my wife at the, my ex-wife. And so I went up to him and I said, Fred, and you know, being an idiot of a human being that sticks his foot in his mouth, I said, yeah, I had not even a, a 49er fan, a Lions fan, uh, but I said, you know, oh my God, you know, thinking of something to say, I said, Joe, Montana out, that's just a disaster. How can we possibly win a game? And he said, Tim, I like to meet Steve Young. <laughs> <laughs> How steep, buddy. If anybody is going to get us to a Super Bowl, it's you, man. You're the guy. You're, I mean, I am so happy and sweat pouring up in it. Big mess. So, one, uh, one more quick question for Bailey. Oh, have the twins, this is from the, uh, the chat, if, oh, asking if the twins had ever uh, asked you to throw out the first pitch. No, I'm not. Uh, I, maybe, uh, maybe I've been invited back to some twins things, and I was the grand marshal of the Aquatennial Parade. Uh, no, not, not yet. So, not yet. That's I right. would. I'm a fan. <laughs> of course, uh, look, not my team. I like. There are obviously a million questions we'd love to ask you. Uh, Bailey says he'll make a call. And uh, look, we'll have to do Field of Dreams so we can have you back on here again. But first, uh, while we've got time remaining, we want to uh, talk to you about your current project for life. Yes, I've been reading up on this and watching some things and uh, some interviews. And I would, this is fascinating, fans. You definitely got to listen to this because it's an amazing, I think it's loosely based on a true story as well, correct? It is. It's based on a, a true story. Uh, 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 wrongly accused, you know, prisons are full of people that, you know, I didn't realize, you know, you learn so much when you do the movies, uh, when you do a lot of the movies, especially when they're based on true stories. And um, our, uh, you realize in the part that I play and the writing, my, my friend Hank Steinberg, uh, I was, uh, who created a show called Without a Trace, uh, um, and, uh, he was, he had brought me on board and I produced for him and acted for him and have directed for him before. And he brought me on board and, and I really didn't know a lot about what's going on in, in the penal systems or how, you know, what, we only pretend we're doctors and lawyers. We're not really doctors <laughs> and lawyers. Right. So, you know, you'll have to say in any given project, you know, the, Patients to Kipnik with a non-productive cough just came off corticosteroids could be pneumocystis. You won't know what any of that means. But this show for life, ABC, Tuesday night, 10 o'clock on ABC. And we have two more remaining in our order, our first order. And it looks like we'll be back next year. This is the story of Nicholas Pinnock, uh, a British actor, great actor, plays a character... Uh, gets sent to prison for life 
because of the way he chooses to fight for his freedom, being innocent. Uh, and you realize that the way the system works now, somebody has to go to jail. And it, it, it can start off idealistic for a young lawyer. Uh, I'm going to play by the book. I'm not going to do anything, you know, illegal or wrong. And then they fudge something. And the next thing you know, the rest of their life is cutting corners. And they don't necessarily care if the guy's a good, was wrong or not or whether he is guilty or not, somebody's got to go to jail. Prosecutors have to put somebody behind bars for certain crimes. And um, in this case, it's this the lead character. And I play his um, mentor. Uh, I play a former state senator, uh, somebody who is a, prosecuting, a prosecutor and a defendant, public defender as well. And, and I am, I've been disbarred basically because at for the time i've lost my license because of a dui so i'm here to help him try to get himself out, out of prison uh, it's a great part it's a really strong show and it's got 50 cent produces it and he's in it curtis is in it um it's got a really strong cast and dear varma from game of thrones and that's on tuesday nights at 10 we have two more remaining but it's a really Really nice show, and Hank is a really great writer, and has done a really great job. What uh, channel is that on? ABC. It'll be on Channel 7 out there. Tuesday nights at 10, Channel 7. We will definitely make sure everybody in the Twitch watches it and everybody's watching this broadcast, because I've <laughs> seen some episodes, and I, I uh, saw some interviews with the, with the characters based on it. It really is an uplifting and because he, he taught himself to be a lawyer, it's a, it's a great story. So definitely tune into that show. It's it's really good. And I'm not just saying that because you're. You. Yeah. <laughs> it's really yeah. good. Tim, you talked about a number of the baseball players you got to meet as a result of uh, working on the movie. You talked about uh, some professional athletes that aren't baseball players you've had a chance to meet. I'm curious though. You also referenced uh, some actors, uh, Robards, etc. Was there ever an actor that you were starstruck to meet on set where you were sort of, besides Bailey, that is? <laughs> it's tough. Being, in a, being on the, uh, here on, on the Skype with Bailey is tough. Uh, <laughs> it's tough. He, he's, got, he's got me schmitzing and I'm a little sweaty because he's a you know, mascot, one of the great mascots. Um, you know, uh, I'll be, uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, in Michigan, I was born. Born and raised in Michigan, going to the movies. You know, I wanted to be James Bond. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I grew up idolizing movie stars. And in high school, I actually had a couple of little books, one about Robert Redford and one about Paul Newman. And, and I was just starstruck with these guys. They were my heroes, just like you know, most people that go into a profession like sports or acting, you know, you, you're a fan, and I was a big fan of Redford's, big time. And we were, I was acting with him. I've acted in a movie with him, and he cast me in Quiz Show, and he directed me in a movie. But we acted in sneakers together. And there was a scene, it's not in the movie, I think because I did it so bad, actually. But there was a scene where my character brings him into what is the audience thinks is the national security agency offices. And there was a scene in the lobby where we, and it was a big, huge shot where we come in the lobby and then up the stairs. And it was one shot, which leads to a room. Then when we go in the room, there was a scene that was probably a six, seven page scene that we did in one shot. Uh, which is very seldom done. And in the big scene before it, when we did the walk, they called action. And I looked over at Redford, and I said, I'm working with Robert Redford. <laughs> and we, I walked, and I couldn't say a word. But we kept walking, <laughs> because the camera was up high enough, and we both knew, and I directed already, we both knew that they could put the dialogue from one that worked, over one that was bad, so we didn't stop. But I mumbled a couple of things and then didn't talk, and 
maybe it made a couple of hand gestures like I was taught. And we got up to the, the end. Director Phil goes, cut! And he comes bounding over and he looks at me and he says, did you say anything? <laughs> and I said, no. And he goes, what happened? And I go, I looked over. And all of a sudden, I realized I'm in a scene with Robert Redford. And I, th I just was gone. I was a 16-year-old with a book about Robert Redford in Arkansas, you know, stuck in a room going, I want to be an actor one day, you know, and looking in the mirror going, no, nope, I want to I'm reading about Redford and going, no, that's not going to happen. Um, that, that, and, you know, I've, I've, Spielberg has produced uh, a TV show that I was on. Uh, kids were in preschool together, yet I introduced myself every time like he doesn't know me. And he <laughs> says, I know you've worked with me before. I know, I know you. Um, you know, I introduced myself to, you know, uh, most actors. Uh, I never assume they know who I am. Uh, um, unless I've, you know, really done long runs with them. And those are people you get really close with, the ones where you're on a series that runs for a long time. In movies, we might not necessarily, you could be in a movie and never know any of the other people that are in the movie. You can work for a week on a movie and never meet a lot the stars of the movie. Um, but on a TV show, you, you become a team, you become a band, uh, and then you're really close. So uh, I'm... If those people, if I was in a movie with them uh, uh, and I met them later, I always introduced myself. Totally starstruck. Totally. Bailey, one last question from you before we let Michael wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> Bailey, uh, Bailey wants to know if you knew that you were in family ties, Tim. <laughs> you, you know what? I didn't know. I didn't know. Family Ties was another great experience. When I, when I auditioned for Family Ties, I played... A bunch of us, there were at least two of us that played Alex's best friend, Doug. One was Crispin Glover as well. Uh, um, but it was in year three, I think. Uh, and um, I, I got the script. I got one scene and I, for one episode. And I was playing semi-pro ball in L.A. And we were at, at Marine Park. And uh, I was taking batting practice. And... A ball, just barely, my buddy Charlie Mazzola threw a ball, and he didn't throw it hard, uh, but it hit me perfectly on the left side of my foot and created a, a hairline fracture in my foot. And it was on the 4th of July, and I, I tried to walk on it and immediately collapsed and said, I broke my foot. How, how did that, it, it didn't even make it to home plate, you know, uh, and she didn't have great arm anyway so i was like how could this i let it hit me i thought it hurt well i got a cast uh and then i got the audition for family tie and so i went to a store and i i bought a pair of shoes but one was a size like 12 and one was a size you know nine whatever i wear <laughs> and i covered up the cast and then Put, carried my backpack in and laid my backpack on top of the cast while I oh, read wow. the scene because I knew if they saw a broken foot, they wouldn't cast me. So I set my bag down and then I read and they said, that's great. We have another scene we want you to read from another episode <laughs> and we want to go take a look at, at it. And I knew that if I got up and I left the room, they'd see the cast. And I already had an exit plan but I didn't think it could go twice. You know, <laughs> I knew I could distract them. So one of the only times I'd ever cold read, which we call it cold reading, when you really look at it and then you audition with it. Uh, I, I the, but it was so well written, and it was the second episode, which was the bigger, funnier episode for me, best man episode that yep. had Tate Donovan and Billy Campbell in it. Um, that that episode, and I. Left my backpack. I didn't leave the room, uh, and and I and I'm, I'm I'm not a good reader uh, at, at all. I'm certainly not a good cold reader. And I read it, and I, I got the part. And then on the way out of the room, I made sure they I was talking to them, and they were looking at me in the eye. And went to rehearsal, got cast, was there the next week. And about day two of rehearsal, Meredith Baxter Burney saw my 
gigantic boot and my little foot on the other side, and she screamed and completely inappropriately. What if those were actually the size of my real feet? And I said, I have a broken. And I went, I had the cat cast cut off about three weeks early and laced up some ankle high, you know. Know, boots and um, and made it through the rest of the week. That's great. Uh, well, listen, uh, Michael, I know your family is watching and very excited for you to talk to Timothy. So we'll have you ask him the last question before we uh, let everybody go for the night. Oh, man, all the pressure on me, Jesse. And thank you. Yeah, that the, for those fans watching, Bailey wanted me to, because I was like, do you remember your own family ties? Because I got nervous, Tim. I got nervous <laughs> when I met you. Um, the last question I'll ask, and thank you again so much for taking the time out talking to to all of us here. Um, I got texted a lot today from friends and family and people that just love your career and the, specifically this movie. And it got me to thinking and the, some of the friends texted me, would you have wanted or do you think the movie would have been as good if the twins had won at the end? Obviously, the writer always said the twins are always meant to lose and his script, which he learned or which he uh, th thought up of this, the movie idea of driving on the 405 in Los Angeles, which is kind of funny. But I think that movie is so good because even though they lose, you still feel really good at the end because the kid goes out, you know, into the stadium at the end, raises his hat. So do you think that was the right choice? Do you think the movie would have been as memorable if the, the Twins had won that game? Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't. Because the, the, the baseball, it wasn't really a movie about baseball. It was about, do you belong, does a kid belong with his friends or does he belong in the adult world? And the the friends win and that's where the heart was at and he goes back to being a kid had we won the game and he made that decision which was a win for him personally um then it would have been win, -win. and it wouldn't have worked as well story-wise so i think what what helps set the table is the heartache you know of how close we got um and i don't think it would have played as well in the kids' storyline, um, and in truth, you know, when you see the the arc of the season, it was a win. The fact that we made it to even a, a one game, you know, playoff, whatever it is, in the movie with a thirteen year old leading the way. Uh, is that how old Luke is in the movie? Is he thirteen? <laughs> um, that's a win, and he did that. That was that that scene where he comes out. And all those fans are there. That was, we shot that. That was fan appreciation night. It was the last night of the season oh. against the Mariners. And that's when we started work that very Monday with the Mariners there. We had, that's how they, that's why they chose the Mariners. Because a lot of it was production driven. And we shot that. Uh, that was, I, I think, maybe the first thing we shot. One of the first, first things in the movie was oh, wow. that scene with Luke going out there and it was it was a sold out you know dome it was it was pretty exciting to be in the in the middle of that and watching that he was in the middle but we were on the field and that was pretty cool and the twins letting us do that was pretty cool yeah it's a very iconic scene where he holds his hat up like that it's a great scene in the movie and it's great and and you know that early in the movie he didn't have all the experience of knowing Everybody. and he didn't you know that was that's a confident he he's great in that moment luke and you know as a 13 year old kid it, it's hard to be self-conscious when you're acting in front of a crew uh in front of the people you're across from let alone you know forty thousand fans or whatever there was there probably wasn't that many but whatever their stadium had at the time and to go out and hold your hat up and to have that confidence to play that was really impressive and kind of helped us know that we had a good team. We had a good movie and it was being helmed right by Andy Scheinman, you know, uh, but it was a great moment. And it was exhilarating to have the fans screaming and yelling like that. It was, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, Tim, I have dozens of more questions to ask you. I'm sure Michael does, too, and I know the fans in the chat room do, and I know Bailey does as well. Um, but we are going to wrap it up here. We want to thank you so much for joining me. Like I said, we're just going to start going down your filmography to sort of force you to come back and talk to us again. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. You guys were great. Thank, so, thank you. 
For Timothy Busfield, for Michael Alexander, and of course for our producer and mascot, Bailey, thanks for watching, Kings fans and hockey fans and just movie fans in general. I am Jesse Cohen. We'll talk to you again soon.